Well, a hearty shalom to you. Jeffrey Seif here coming to you from my study into your studying world. The object of our attention is the book that's called The Acts of the Apostles, wherein we uh, encounter the advancement of the gospel in and beyond Israel. Bibles to the Jew first and also to the Greek, according to Paul, and we see how it, in fact, came to the Jews first. And I'm glad that it's coming to Jewish people again. And I'm glad that you care about it. And I'm glad to have participated in tendering a translation that was put together principally, though not exclusively, by women and men of Jewish extract who came to faith, who wanted to uh, recover the Semitic imprint on the biblical witness. Well, here we are. Uh, this week's text, Acts 2, 42 through 47, is less about the gospel advancing as much as it is a window into the experience of those uh, who have already experienced the gospel's advancement into their own life and circumstance. And we can see evidence of transformed lives by the way they're performing. And I want you to take a look at it with me, please. We're told that those who had had uh, an existential encounter with the Lord, in verse 42, they were devoting themselves to the teaching of the emissaries and to fellowship, to breaking bread and to prayers. They're devoting themselves to, that is to say, it's a continual process. They're devoting themselves to the teaching of the emissaries or the apostles. And by the way, the way that we devote ourselves to the teaching of the apostles is to get our uh, hands into the clay of the biblical witness. Uh, preserved therein is the testimony of those first Talmudim. And uh, it's hard to say that we're devoted to their teaching if we never take a look at the book that gives voice to it. Well, there's a commitment to the apostolic witness and to fellowship and to breaking bread and prayers. Uh, fellowship entails a bunch of fellows in the same ship. Uh, if you look at early Jesus' experience, it's communal experience. And I agree with St. Augustine on this score, though in a variety of ways I'm no friend of his. Um, but uh, he did say, if you don't have the church as your mother, you don't have God as your father. And um, we live in a world today where Jesus is marketed, privatized, you know, our personal relationship with Jesus. And I don't want to diminish that. It's important to have a personal relationship with him. Similarly, uh, if someone has a relationship with him, then they're going to have a relationship with others that are involved in him. Uh, we live in a world today that's so characterized by fracture in so many ways, it's worth underscoring that if you look in the, in the literature here, uh, an attestation of a transformed life is a commitment to the communal aspect of living the biblical life. We're told uh, that they broke bread together, they ate together, they shared together, they cared together, they prayed together. We're told as well in verse 43 that fear laid upon every soul and that many wonders and signs were happening through the emissaries. Fear here isn't panic attack fear. Um, it could perhaps be better construed as awe and wonder, shock and awe, where you're just kind of spellbound and your reverence, you're so overwhelmed. There's a sense here that these people are in the presence of something that's great. Uh, they're in the presence of greatness. And indeed, that's true. They're living at such a dynamic moment, uh, such a pivotal moment in human history. Uh, and it's awe-inspiring to be here at the cutting edge uh, of this revival. And there's a kind of amazement by the wonders and signs that were happening. You know, relative to those signs, I like to say that Jesus didn't have a going out of business sale. Uh, he still wants to shock and awe. I believe that, that, that he does miracles today, that in his name, healings are performed. That said, I'm not a big fan of the industry that's grown up around uh, perpetrating uh, signs and wonders and miracles. And I think there is an industrial element to it that made a lot of people rich, you know, in the name of prosperity and signs and wonders and so forth. Well, I like to say that I'm a charismatic believer in spite of the movement, not because of it. Uh, that really is true. But the essential core theological convictions that, that Yeshua does heal 
and that there are miracles available in him. I mean, I, I subscribe to that. I hope those of you that differ won't think the less of me before, because of it. We'll just have to agree to disagree. But here I note that Signs and Wonders really captivates a crowd. And Gordon Lindsay, someone who advocated for Signs and Wonders, said that one miracle is better than a thousand sermons. And I think he has a point. In any case, we're told again in verse 44 to move on, that all who believed were together, having everything in common. They were together. Again, there's this communal aspect to what it means to walk with the Lord. And they share. Here, there's a kind of a radical commonality, a sharing uh, with goods and the like. And they began selling property and possessions and sharing them with all as any had need. I personally don't believe they did this out in perpetuity. You know, there are revivals where there's a rush of enthusiasms and people liquidate assets to support the new move. But the truth of the matter is life can't be supported just by forever liquidating assets. Uh, we do have to return to a normalized kind of life. I, uh, I, I do believe it's just not God's work that needs our money, that, that we need it too. Uh, we have legitimate self-interests uh, to pay for a home, you know, transportation, for, to raise and attend to the business of our families and have a little recreational monies. I don't begrudge anybody that. Uh, you know, I've thought oftentimes the most dangerous place for a hundred dollar bill is in the wallet of someone going to church, you know, because the preachers always find a way and trying to find a way to get at it. Well, I mean, certainly religious institutions need money. You've heard me make a pitch for the Messianic Jewish uh, society that I represent, the Tree of Life uh, Bible Society, certainly. Uh, good works uh, make their appeal and good people respond to it. And here, certainly, people are responding to it radically. And my only point here is they don't do that in perpetuity. Things normalize, but we're not here at the normalized moment, right at the cusp of a revival. And they're just giving it all up. We're told that day by day, in verse 46, they continued with one mind, spending time at the temple and breaking bread from house to house. I like this to underscore that they still lived as Jews. No one told them, oh, you accepted Jesus, now you're a Pentecostal. You know, you go to First Assembly of God. You know, if you would have come up to these people and said, you know, how long you've been a converted Jew, they would have said, I'm not really a converted Jew, I'm a converted sinner, and it's not a sin to be a Jew. You still see them living uh, within a Jewish worldview. Uh, there's still, you see demonstrable fidelity to the temple worship here, where they go up there uh, and participate still in Jewish social life, in Hebraic uh, forms and functions. They partner in all of that. And those of us in the Messianic Jewish world, we still live within that world. Uh, we don't hear Yeshua beckoning us out of it, in part because when we open up the testimony to what it means to walk with them, we see them still living in it. If it's good enough for Peter, it's good enough for me. And uh, so it is. We're told as well they were sharing meals with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord was adding to their number those who were being saved. A point here about having favor with people. I, I don't believe in needlessly alienating people. Uh, it's very easy for us interpersonally to conjecture what's wrong with that other person in our web of relationships. What's wrong with them? Uh, it can be in our personal relationships. Here's what's wrong with the people we work with. Here's what's wrong with the people we worship with. It's not just a question of what's wrong with them personally, but what's wrong with the organization structurally, what's deficient in the organization philosophically. You know, if I'm scratching a little bit where you're itching, I'm just telling you that's human nature that uh, it is so very easy to be critical. I think if we're going to have favor with people, we need to be favorably inclined toward people, foibles with humanity notwithstanding. If you want to live in a perfect world, I'm telling you, heaven awaits you. But until such time as you get there, you're going to have to deal with mortals that are shackled with this earth suit, just like you, imperfect people. Better it is, it seems to me, to be kindly disposed, gracious, merciful. And as a result of that, one is the better able to have favor with people.
because they notice there's a little light shining in us and that we're marching to the tune of a different drummer. Well, they surely were, and the world was paying attention. I hope that our little trip down memory lane today gives you some precious reminders of what you need to be about in your walk with the Lord. I know I get a reminder. Well, blessings to you. Uh, next week, let's do this again. Same time, same station. Jeffrey Seif, signing out.